Top of the Props is brought to you by Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming. 1 slash 10 Holly Lee Road, Lemire. Find them on Facebook. Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming MacArthur, where every pup's a king or queen. And GameView. GameView is a statistical application that allows you to track, analyse and improve your team's and players' performance by capturing team and individual player statistics. Find out more, gameview.com.au. And it's now time for another episode of Top of the Props, and we're now up to episode 12. And the bloke we're about to speak to again, well, he's our he's our daily messenger. He's the one that was nice enough to reply to that first email and say, absolutely, I'd be happy to be the first guest on episode one. And it just so happens he's, he's one of the best front rowers to ever play the game of rugby league anywhere in the universe. It's Shane Webke. G'day, mate. It's great to speak to you again. Likewise, mate. I, I hope that I, you know, that I went first. I'm just wondering how did I measure up for the uh, the next 11? Mate, well, listen, you've done very, very well. And look, the, it, it's I'll tell you where we started with, and I don't know how much you know about podcasts, but we started on something as the host podcast on Podbean. And then from there, we're now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio, which is hard to get into. You've actually got to send them a cover letter and tell them about your podcast. So, wow. you, yeah, you, you've pushed us, mate. We're, we're shooting for the stars, and we're, we're in the stratosphere now. So thank you very and, much. And I, and I pioneered it. Amazing. Yeah, you did. That's right. You're, <laughs> you're our Dally M. <laughs> That's quite funny. Uh, way too generous, but funny nonetheless. Well, look, Shane, we, we did cover a lot of your, your career in the last episode, and I did have a listen yep. this afternoon, and th- there was obviously um, plenty we didn't get to. But I'm going to do things a little bit different tonight. I, I, I did yep. put it out um, on social media through our Facebook page, The 81st Minute, on Twitter, The 81st Minute, uh, and people could also email through at The 81st Minute um, at Outlook.com and send through questions for you, Shane. So um, I've got a few questions that we didn't get to last time and then we'll we'll throw out some more questions from the fans as well. How about that? Oh, brilliant. That'll be good. Yeah, no, I look forward to it. Perfect. All right. So look, one of the things we didn't talk to uh, talk to you about the first time around because I, I guess it wasn't relevant, relevant at the time, but t- talking about the current situation with the Brisbane Broncos, it, it would be remiss of me not to ask you what your personal feelings are, particularly being there uh, in in Bris Vegas and seeing at like the, the the stress that the club is under at the moment. What's your personal take, not just as a fan but as a, as one of the great players of the club? What's it like up there at the moment, and what's your personal feelings on, on what's happening with the Broncos? Oh, look, it's a it's a it's a fairly dour sort of uh, atmosphere at the moment. Um, you know, in terms of Broncos supporters and the club itself, and and, you know, obviously this is uncharted territory for, for the Broncos in terms of, I mean, we've had our bad, you know, our, our uh, seasons where we didn't perform perhaps as well as we'd like to. Yep. Um, and, 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 look, of course, we, we aren't at a, at, a, at, a, at a juncture yet where we're talking about the season gone. We, we're, you know, in the middle of one. Um, but we've certainly, in the last, you know, I think three of our biggest losses have come in, in the last sort of, you know, if you count the, the game last year against the, the Eels and then come through these two bad losses we've had now, mm. um, it's as bad a run of, of, of bad of bad losses that we've encountered. And, and mate, rightly so, Broncos supporters expect more. Yeah. And I think that, and they're entitled to do that. And that's not to say that, you know, I, I'm very I'm reluctant to be one of these ex-players sitting on the sidelines chucking rocks and being in the media and, and you know, if I've got something really particularly harsh I want to say to players or, or to the club, I'll say it to the club. Yeah. I won't, I'm not going to go through a public forum to do that. So I've been very measured in any sort of comment that I've been asked to have in my role at, at Channel 7 on the sports desk or uh, where I've been interviewed about it. But suffice to say, mate, those players need to understand it's nowhere near good enough. Yeah. Now, Excuses have been made um, about the, you know, the youth of the squad and all the rest. So, well, well, then we're talking about uh, perhaps a little bit of roster management um, mm. that we, our club finds itself in a situation where we're having to pick such young sides. I'm not being critical of that either because the game has changed so much since I played, mm. and and the way that the. the you know, and, and the, the age of the players come into fruition has changed. Um, player movement has changed, become far more fluid. Uh, you know, loyalty has largely died 
um, and you know people aren't really particularly loyal to clubs anymore. So that may all that adds up to is that you know roster management is all the more difficult. Um, but but you'd look at ours now and think that you know. Um, not that it's anyone's fault, but we find ourselves with a roster that's a bit hard to manage um, mm. simply because of the youth. But here's the, here's the rub. They can keep that side together, mate. In four or five seasons, maybe not even that long, in, in three to four seasons, they'll be formidable. Mm. But here's the real challenge. The real challenge, Curtis, is because no one wants to play on a losing side. The great, seed, the great sides that I was part of in the 90s and the early 2000s stayed together and accepted less because we used to win. Yeah. And we love to. I mean, you can talk about money all you like, but there is no price to be put on winning premierships and, and what comes with that. Mm. So the challenge for the club really now is because there is some exceptional footballing talent assembled at that club right now. Mm. The challenge is to keep them together, is to keep our fan base together as they grow, as they as they mature, as they they mould into hopefully. Um, a premiership winning side. The other thing is, mate, the clock is ticking for the Bronx. Uh, our last premiership was in 2006. Yep. I mean, that is a dry run by our standards. Um, and so this is all incumbent now upon the, the, the current playing group to understand it. And look, what they need to, and, and this is what I have said publicly, is they've got another chance this week. So next, last week was, was diabolical by any standard you want to measure it by. Yeah. So that, that 59 nil flogging um, at the hands of last year's Premiers, the Roosters, was diabolical for one reason. Their defence was completely inept, mm. completely. And if you want to measure the attitude of a football side, look at how they tackle. Because mm. that's, that's the difficult part of league. Everyone wants to run the ball. They, they line up one after the other to run it. But it is tackling where the hard work is, and we were disgraceful. And so that's an attitude thing, because that's all it is. They all know how to tackle. They just didn't want to tackle. They didn't tackle. They didn't get it done. So, okay, let's fast forward to, to Manly, which is tomorrow night, which um, is a litmus test of all litmus tests. Yeah. Because if they throw that stuff up again this week, if they throw up a, a, a defensive performance, they, I'm not talking about winning. Mm. Don't worry. Winning is not the point now because I think we all accept that with such a young team and with the disruption that's going on, it's going to be pretty hard for us to do anything in this season. Mm. But what they can do and what they must do is show us that they have that 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 ticker, right? Yeah. That, that, that in my mind makes up what Broncos players have always been about and what their club's always attended. Mm. And that means this week they need to tackle their hearts out. If I was coaching that side and I'm not, and I'm very reluctant to give uh, unsolicited advice to coaches, but if I were doing, I would focus on nothing else except defence. Yeah. Because attack, attack generally looks after itself. But but where our problem lies right now is our attitude and defence. And if and if we show resolve and resilience in that and come back out this week, um, and even if we get ourselves beaten, but we go down and die, we you know we die trying, so to speak. Mm. People will be okay with that. People will accept that. Okay, it's a young team; they're finding their feet. But they will not put. That, I, I promise you one thing, Curtis: they won't cop another. They won't cop another performance like last week. They will not do it. Yeah, and, and particularly yeah. in such a close competition, sixteen teams, and the salary cap, as we know, it, it makes it so even. What I what I argued, with, with, and a lot of people are talking about this new rule change, Shane. And I'll, I'll quickly get your opinion on that in a second with the six again rule. But I would argue that if you go back to two thousand, two thousand and one. The game was as quick uh, than the game we've seen in the last couple of weeks. But I think the difference is is that I think what we've seen with the teams that are winning and winning well is that these are teams that are maybe not necessarily just as fit, but it certainly looks that way. But they've been coached to win it at, 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 no matter what. that, that they, They're coached to win. While it looks like some other teams are coached not to lose. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it sort of does. It sort of does because that's... Who's gonna Who's gonna be good? The good football teams now are gonna be the ones who adapt to this rule. Yeah. The rule's gonna stay because, in my opinion, the rule the rule is exactly the right thing. It has taken all that ugly, unwarranted contest out of the ruck, and and made yep. it back to you know players have got to show discipline again now. And so what what that changes is is defence. Yep. And and it and it, we've already seen it. So the teams who are, who are showing ill discipline and and laying in, in the rock and, and making infringements in there and incurring that, that six again, they're getting smashed. Mm. And so people are worried that's going to turn and touch football. It's not. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is teams are going to learn 
the new way to play on the ruck. The wrestler's gone. The yep. wrestler's now not part of the game. You know what? I think it's a great thing. Absolutely. And what's now coming back into play, and I was, you know, a, a, a 112 plus kilo front rower. Mm. What we had to do, we couldn't afford, you know, in the era that I played, the game, the game and you're right, you, you rightly say, it was just as quick. Don't worry about that because we yeah. didn't have it. That wrestle stuff was just coming in. And so we still had to manage our energy. So yeah. that so that we were right in the fence. But what happened when the wrestle came into to prominence is that they slowed it down so much, it wasn't as challenging for, for in the defensive line because you had plenty of time to get back and get set and get and get a bit of a breather. Yeah. Whereas now what this has done is it's 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 brought back in that endurance factor. Yep. And that's what blows the holes out. And that's why you're seeing such so many breaks now at the moment. Now, it'll keep like that because players can't help themselves. We always make infringements in the ruck. Mm. And then, so the six-again thing will always be coming into play. But it'll, it'll drop right off. Yep. And you won't see these big blowouts like we're seeing now because teams will work it out. And, and you know, even for the teams, the most ill-disciplined of clubs will work out it's going to kill them if they keep giving away the infringement. So, so therefore, it'll change. So I think it's a wonderful rule. The other thing I think is just magnificent is going back to one referee. Oh, beautiful. I just, exactly. I cannot, yep. I cannot applaud that enough. Mm. And there's evidence that, that it works is that the, the forward pass ruling yep. um, against uh, Manly. Yep. Now, the forward pass ruling and the touchy made that call and he got it wrong. Mm. And guess what? He hasn't been crucified. Mm. You know why? Because now people accept, in my mind, accept that, okay, we haven't got the second ref on the field. Maybe we haven't got all the layers of, of um, officiating that we, we had. Mm. So people are a little bit kinder and think, well, you know what? They're here, but they're going to make mistakes. And they will make mistakes. But I just think it might usher in a new era of thinking, right, oh, we don't, they haven't got eight. Because when the more, the more layers of of officiating you put on there, the more people expect that, okay, well, this should be perfect. Yeah. Take some of that away, you bring the human factor back into it, and I just think it all works better. It's, 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 it's entirely a better um, outcome all around. And the other thing which, which I mentioned on, on Twitter, I think it I can't remember which game it was, but I think it might have been the first week, the Broncos para game, where I said post-match, I said the, the best thing about one referee and how quick it is with the six again rule is is that Channel 9 and Fox don't have enough time to show 10,000 replays and get everyone upset by a little knock-on or a strip rule that didn't go anyone's way. It's just play on. It's like the old days. You're just going to play the game. It's a very interesting point you make because, and you're 100% right, and I hadn't really thought about it, but I have noticed it, is you, you rightly say that, you know, the broadcasters now haven't got time to fill in, in, in their broadcast because guess what? It just keeps happening. Yeah, the footy, the footy keeps happening. Now, if we're thinking that way, what's on TV, and that means the punters are saying, they're seeing the game. They're mm. seeing the game unravel. They're not seeing a replay of what happened five minutes ago. They're just seeing the game unravel as it comes. And I reckon that, that is what's been so appealing um, in these early stages of this new competition, if you like, um, to, to, to the viewing public. But also, when we get crowds back in there, I reckon they're going to love it. I just think, I think there have been a couple of subtle little changes to our game, mm. which are long overdue. And, and you know what, in a, in a time like this is when you can get great change through because, you know, we're living in a world that's upside down. So that means anything doesn't look like that big a change at the moment, given what we've been through. Mm. So therefore, the Landis has been able to get these things through. Mm. And by the geez, it's made a difference. Absolutely. And, and people, people forget like that. Like, we'll get back to the footy, like you said. And I've been to many games in Sydney, Shane, over the last couple of years where you sit there, you feel like you're there for four hours and you feel like you spend half the time talking to your mates next to you or whatever you're doing or if you're up in the media box, you're eating sausage rolls when you should be watching the game. There won't be no time to do any of that because you'll be watching the footy. So that's awesome and I agree with everything you said and I'm glad you I'm glad you agree with me on all that stuff. Um, but we'll keep it rolling and I've got another one for you before we get to the fan questions and something we yep. didn't talk about um, last time round, and before we get to 2001 and what happened with Alfie's return and Queensland bringing the origin yep. back into state of origin, I think it was poignant to, to talk about 2000, which might be a little bit um, upsetting for you to talk about from, from a Queensland Maroons p- perspective, but I think that that kind of explains how we got to the end of the 2001 series. So if you remember, you guys, you guys won the 99 series one all. 
with because yes. one of the games was drawn, so That's you, right. you kept the series. Uh, Matt Rogers had a big ninety nine series. We get to two thousand, and I think, and and I don't know. I probably should have looked into this, but I don't know what kind of relationship you got with Gordy Tallis now. But as a captain, there was a lot going on in the media before the 2000 series, and it bubbled all the way through to the end until, of course, what we're going to get to in a second, and some comments in the media and everything else. But I think it started in Game One at Homebush, where you guys, you guys were in it to you know up to your teeth, and then I think Gordy, um, I, I don't know if he actually called Billy Harrigan a cheat, but it was very close to. And then he got binned, and, and of course, the, the famous footage of Adrian Lamb begging Bill Harrigan not to, to send him off. And then I think Harrigan sent him, and then Peachy, or one of the Blues, scored. And the Blues won by four points, 20-16. to 16. Um, I want to fast forward to Game 2. Forget the whole first half. Game 2 at Suncorp, 2000. User up 4-0 at half time. So even then, at that point, this almost halfway through the, the series... In fact, perfectly halfway through the series, the series is in the balance. You're up 4 0. I think it was Matt Rogers' two field goals. And then the Blues came out in the second half, won the second half 28 6. Was, how much effort did it take just to, to get you guys up by four at half time at Suncorp in game two against a very, very good Blues pack and a very good team? And then was the second half just kind of a bit of a. Just an energy release and a letdown that you just couldn't keep up. Can you can you try to explain that whole game one, the emotional landslide and, and Gordy as captain and everything else? Because he, mate, he's a bit like you in the way that if he gets asked something, he's get, he's not going to piss in your pocket. He's going to tell it exactly how it is. How much energy went through those first couple of games and then the Blues to run over the top is in game two, um, heading into Sydney for game three. Well, of course that's what happens. So we lose the first game. Um, and I, you know, obviously we're going back a long way so you'll forgive my memory if I get a bit of this no, wrong no that's but, right mate go but, for it but what I do recall um, as it was always losing any origin game it doesn't matter whether you, you lose you know if you've lost the first two and then you lose the third one yeah it, it, they all hurt it, yeah. it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you win the series uh, if you've won the series by winning the first two games then you lose the third one you hurt mm. because that is the nature of that rivalry it is it is you know, in, in Australian sport, it doesn't come any more bitter than New South Wales v Queensland. Yeah. And so then when you lose one um, and lose the way we did with Gordy being sent off, and he called him a cheat several times. He I did, okay. He did. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, there was no problem. And he, and he says that now too. So yeah. there's no problem. He, he called him a cheat, he, and he might have added an, an adjective or two to it. Yeah. But anyway, so he gets sent off, we lose. Did we lose because Gordy got sent off? No, we didn't. Mm. We lost because we, we didn't tackle to the end. Mm. So that's how you lose, mate. So, you know, anyone who wants to rely on the fact or, or try to apportion some blame to Gordon's actions, well, that's just foolish. Mm. Because history will always tell us you can work, you can win 12, 12 on 13. It's not easy, but you can do it. So anyway, um, so picture what, what the disappointment that, you know, in a, in a losing origin shed, particularly in the first game, because... History also tells us that if you lose the first game, you generally don't win the series. Yeah. So we marshaled everything we had to get to that second game and to get to four nil at half time. Mm. And, I, and I suspect, I suspect, um, given what happened in the third game, we probably weren't we weren't as great a side as perhaps, or weren't as good as um, those that first. Uh, three halves of football had shown. Yeah. And what I mean by that is maybe New South Wales had a fair bit more to give and they hadn't given it. And they found some, they, for whatever reason, you know, we come out, we start that second half, clearly we must have been a bit flat. They started it well. And confidence is a very funny thing, see. So they obviously start the second half well and then they start to gel. Mm. And, then, and then they just come home, like come right over the top of us. And mate, I can't begin to tell you how demoralising that is. Mm. Um, and then, so, you know, at that point we've lost the series. Mm. So then the real challenge, the ultimate challenge, is to go to a dead rubber against a side who's just touched you up. Mm. It is a real challenge and a real mountain to climb to get up for that. And and, it's, and, and what I don't mean that in a sense, of course, you know that there's a 3 nil whitewash at, at stake, so you don't want that to happen. And so you got all the motivation in the world, 
but sometimes that isn't enough, and, and I think the result in that game proved it. Mm. That, 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 what, and, and look, I'm a New South Welshman through and through, mate, and, and as a, what, 15-year-old or whatever it was at the time, I was, you know, cock a hoop. But when you watch it back on YouTube, and before we get to Game 3, Game 2, I think Junior Pierce came down to the bench, and the whole, like, it was like a party on the Blues bench. And I, I felt, watching it back this week, that it was very unoriginal like the, the way they were going and I know they were winning they were on the, you know on the verge and they were winning the series in Brisbane which is not something that New South Wales always does but just you know just the, a bit of the character on the sideline and then Gordon came out before Origin 3 and said you know you shouldn't play game 3 was that was that how low the, the Maroons were feeling coming down to Sydney yeah I, I can I vaguely remember him talking about that and I, and I thought it was bullshit to be honest yeah that's what uh, I was going to ask you yeah yeah, and I, and I love Gordy, and we get on. We're good mates, and we we'll always will be. But that doesn't mean we can't disagree with each other. Mm. And, and at that particular point, I, I do disagree with that mm. um, because you know the origin concept is the origin concept, and, you, and it should not be mucked around with. Yeah. And, and it's a three-game series, and and there's no such thing as a dead rubber. Mm. I mean, obviously that was going to a dead rubber, but but the pride that is on the line there, and and when you're in that team, um, be it New South Wales or Queensland. There's an enormous amount at stake, regardless of the state of the series, if mm. that makes sense. Yep. So, so you know, our chance, well, what we what we had the chance to do was go out and play that third game and get into them and actually say, you know what, we might have got it wrong in the first two games, but you're not as good as you think you are. Mm. But we didn't do that. We did the opposite. Now, once again, and now I'm re- recollecting this, perhaps people will want to say, well, you know, Gordon's Gordon saying, well, we should be playing a third game is reflective of a general attitude within the team. It wasn't. Mm. And that's... But, you know, you can't help but think, and I suppose, you know, when you're on the inside of it, you can't... You, know, you clearly can't have a, a, a perspective that some outside people do. Mm. But when you've got your captain saying something like that, what is it really saying? Mm. And so, I think... And Gordy would disagree, and that's fine. But I think... You know, in hindsight, he shouldn't have said something like that. Mm. I don't think it was helpful. And and I can't recall the exact team we had, and I don't think it was a very young side. Well, I, I know it was a young side because it got completely and utterly changed in yeah. 2001 when it won't come back as a result of what happened in that third game. Mm. But I really don't think your captain needs to be saying shit like that because I don't think it helps. Um, and, I, and I don't know whether Gordy reflects upon that now. I know and Gordy like I do. He would not retract from it. He would. There would have been a reason he said it, and he would have believed it. But understand this: I know one thing. Mm. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have meant that he had an attitude going into the game. You know, and I don't give a shit. I know he doesn't think like that, and I know he wouldn't think like that. Yeah. So it's important to note that. But but oh, I look, just don't I think. Don't, it was a, yeah, don't get me yeah. wrong, Shane. I, what I, what I, what I think he meant by that was he was so passionate about Queensland that he felt like. Like that, you know, like it was like they'd already lost the series, and he felt so bad for the state. That's what I think he meant. I, of course, you know, it's yeah, the yeah. raging bull. You know, like that's yeah. right, that's right. And so, what the point I'm really making is that I know that Gordon, when he said it, I know that it was never going to affect him, mm. and I know that he could say that. But what I think he failed to understand is what that does is a reverberation through the team. Yeah. Now, they're all grown men, of course. They make their own decisions and they, they, they don't necessarily need to be affected by words. When something comes out of that, and from memory, it got so much airplay, it was huge. Mm. It can't help but affect the preparation. Yeah. Um, and I think <clears throat> the way I look at it, it wasn't a helpful thing to do. But I do understand that it wouldn't have affected Gordon. Mm. But a lot of it, I mean, Gordon's a funny bloke. He's, a, he's a, he is, as you say, hard on the sleeve. He'll literally say something that if I say something in the media, which I think is a little bit controversial, I'll think about it and think, oh, geez, you know, hmm. what, you know, what effects is this going to have? Go on to go to the pub and have a beer, wouldn't think about it again. <laughs> that's, that's just how it is, you know? And so, yeah, it was, I just don't think it helped us, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and look, and, and, and this leads right into to what I, I want to talk about from a, from a Queensland perspective, is leading into 2001, because I wanted to explain possibly Queensland's lowest ebb uh, since Origin started in 1980 was 2000. Um, 
you guys rolled some bloody dices in 2001. So you mentioned Wayne Bennett comes back um, after a two-year hiatus. Um, not such a roll of the dice because, you know, he's the best coach in Queensland and one of the best yep. coaches of all time. But then you just roll out ten debutants for game one. And I, I, I think, with all due respect to some of the blokes, and I'm not going to name anyone because they won the series of Queensland. But if you stack those guys up against some of the other players in origin history, particularly around that time, against the Blues and all the Australian forwards they had and, you know, all the pretty boys in their back line and all that stuff, I, I think they were banking on passion, mongrel, and just getting a job done for, uh, for you know, for, for what we saw now as a wounded bull that had to get up and, and stand up and do something. 34-16 in game one at, at, at Suncorp. What was it like? That was the last game at, at Suncorp too, wasn't it, before it got knocked down? So, I'll tell you what happened. So, and why it worked. Wayne, Wayne obviously, you know, as a proud Queenslander and a great believer in the legacy of origin and all the rest of it, mm. could not sit by, sit by and watch that. You know, and I think he realised that a bit of a, a malice, if you like, had set in, or a malaise rather, had, had set in to, to the, the current crop of players, many of which, me included, had been there for a while. Mm. And he knew it needed to shake up. And this is where Wayne's got great perspective about these things. He knew it just needed to clean out. Now, that's no disrespect to the players that, that were uh, ousted, and certainly it's no disrespect to the players who were brought in. But the fact remains is that he understood that, it, that change needed to be made, and he did it, and it was huge. And, and, and you're right when you say it was uh, huge. So that's all right. What that does is bring young, enthusiastic players who will be given an opportunity they didn't think they were going to get, and it's infectious. And I remember being one of the ones who survived the carnage. Um, I remember being invigorated by it. Mm. And so away we go into that game. Now, the great choppy close mm -hmm. was our manager. Now, if you want to know why we played so well in that first game, he's the reason. Mm. So, one of Choppy's roles was, particularly when Wayne was coaching, but always, um, was a, he's a great motivator and, and passion. But you, when they talk about passion that Queensland has got, it, there should be a picture of Chris Close because mm. he, he is the personified. But he's a believer, not convoluted. When Choppy wells up and gets pumped up, it's because he believes. And I can't believe, I can't tell you how infectious that is. So anyway, the last, before we get on the bus from the team hotel in Brisbane City somewhere, um, going to Lake Park. So it's not a long bus ride. So we have this meeting. And you can imagine how young and this side is and how nervous everyone's feeling. And, you know, it's a very precarious time because you don't want to be wasting too much energy, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, Choppy's, one of Choppy's things was is he always gave us the last speech before we got on the bus because you had a bit of time then to, you know, on a quiet bus to think about things and let things sink in. He gave one of the most rousing speeches that I, and most meaningful and most heartfelt things I've ever heard. Mm. And it was around about defending, because Wayne was copping plenty for making all those changes. Yep. You know, he was copping heaps. And Choppy more or less said to us, that if you blokes don't go out there tonight and have a fucking dig yeah. and play like Queenslanders should play, he said, I'm going to the media and I'm going to expose you as, as, as the fucking soft cocks that he's <laughs> <laughs> And these young blokes are sitting there. I, I, I knew Choppy, so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, Choppy, that's good material. And I'm blowing in too, so I'm thinking, you know what, mate, I'm in. I'm in, I'm with you. You won't be exposing me come Monday morning, I assure you. But anyway, I sort of looked around and saw all these young fellas. And you've got to remember, Choppy's a very revered figure. And, yeah. and so he holds a lot of sway, particularly those young players, those 10 debut ones. And they're all sitting there shitting themselves. <laughs> and thinking, this bastard means it. And yeah. he did, mate. I promise you, because he said, and, he, and Wayne wasn't in the room then, he said, see that bloke out there, if you blokes let, after everything he's done for you in terms of, his, and he took all the media flack, he took everything, Wayne, that week. Yeah. He said, he, he has paved the way and put everything on the line for you blokes. And if you just let him down, I'm going to fucking expose every one of you. <laughs> <laughs> see, it was, it was powerful. I got goosebumps talking about it. <laughs> and mate, and we went out and we did what we did. Yeah. Now, that was a culmination of things, but that, that speech, 
to make no mistake, I put that down as, as the real reason that, that that we won that game so so comprehensively. And it just it just was the right thing to hear at the right time, mm. and it was a good mix between you know what. We'll cuddle your boys and make sure you're okay. But you know what? Don't fuck it up because the whole world is set. And, and it was just what was required. You know what I mean? And, and it's not like he's far away because he used to sit on the sideline, didn't he? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he did. He did all the. He did all the interchange. Yeah. So so got up in the box. He had the, the headphones on, so he he'd get the messages and he'd give them. Um, you know. But I'm quite sure that. He'd get messages from Wayne that might have been one thing, mm. and then he'd put on it what we would call choppy speak. <laughs> <laughs> and the message sometimes might be a whole heap blunder than what Wayne had intended it. Oh, if you know what I mean. And I don't think Wayne Bennett would have cared as long as it works. So. No, 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 no. He had, Chris Close, uh, choppy, he had license because, because Wayne had been there and done it. And, and, and seriously, and mate, I, I would pay homage to him, and I don't know that he'll hear this, but he is one. Of, he is one of the great men of rugby league. Um, he's a great mate of mine, mm. but but the the force that he was in Origin as a player, but then really, really importantly as Queensland manager, mm. um, is is in my mind without measure. He um, he's a and he's a great advocate for the Origin for the Origin concept, but he's he is part of the reason, along with him and, and the blokes of his era. Uh, why it's lasted so long. Um, it's, a, it's a credit to him. And you know what? Just quietly, I might be able to technically get him on the podcast because when he got to the Seagulls, or the, the, the Giants or whatever yep. it was, I'm pretty sure he was yep. playing back row, but I'll have a look. If he played one game at prop, you'll have to get you'll have to help me get him on. And I'll, if he's played at oh, prop, yeah. I'll get him on the show. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure he did. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, look, everyone remembers the Carl Webb try from that game, right? But... I want to. I, I, I want to ask you about the, the other things that Carl Webb did in that game, and uh, I'm reverting back to Gordon Tallis' book again, and uh, and I'm only doing it because obviously it makes sense what we're talking about right now in this era. But he he mentioned, um, and I think he mentions you by name too, that he and you were on the field, and you guys would have the overriding call. So if you were ready for a run, that was your ball, right? And apparently, is it true that Carl Webb was overriding you guys and, and cutting your runs and taking your runs? Oh, like, and I don't, I don't mean know. I don't mean he was being disrespectful. I mean no, 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 possibly no, no, Chris no, no. Close had fired him up that much that he had to get out there and do it. Yeah, no, he was on fire, Charlie. No yeah. worry about that. He was he was absolutely on fire. He was a, he was an exceptionally gifted footballer. No worry about that. And I think I don't think it was a case of and mate, he he may well have. Push me or Gordy out of the way or both of us. Yeah, but we wouldn't have cared, mate. Because when someone's playing like that, you yeah. know, you put all that shit to one side and realise this bloke's on. Mm. Let him go. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and he was on, mate. And he, he was, and he was an enormous part of the reason that we played so well that night. And you know, and that helps blokes like me and Gordy who are, you know, getting we're starting to move to the other side of our Irish careers, like the downward slide. Mm. And and young forwards like that. Ripping and tearing, well, you feed off that. So, so yeah, I I suspect that, that is exactly right, um, and I and I suspect that he did exactly that. And I'd I'd have been happily, I've been happy for him to do it. Wouldn't worry about it. Well, you, you go from that, and and you have an, uh, I'm sure he's had a great night in Brisbane. You would have went out and had a drink somewhere. We just didn't get mobbed too much. But then you get down to Sydney, and a bloke called Bradley Fittler's back, and the Blues beat you pretty easily, twenty six eight. So, again, Queensland needs another masterstroke. So, how much, how much did you know about this Alan Langer thing coming back from the Super League? So, Benny asked us. Benny was really good. So, I was in a senior he, he always believed in senior players groups. And, mm. and he just picked the older heads. And, you know, and our job was, you know, we'd help him. Wayne's, Wayne's an autonomous sort of a leader, but, but he will consult, and, and, and he's good like that, and he'd run things past us, but ultimately he'd make his decisions, and it would be our job to sell it down the line to the players, and that's yeah. fine, we, we all knew that, and we could have some robust discussions, but um, in the end, we would leave there agreeing and with one purpose and one direction. So we get in this meeting at the start of the Origin camp, and he goes, oh, it, it must have been prior to that, because obviously our... Uh, but anyway, whenever it was, it wasn't mm. too far before the, the camp was starting. Mm. And so, he, are, you, are you saying before Camp Game Three or before Origin two thousand and one? No, no, no. Before Game Three. Okay. Yep. And he said he consulted us. It must have been. 
It must have been what the, as the camp was starting. It was. Mm. Um, so we might have gone in for the first night. But anyway, we'd had this meeting, and he said, "Listen, boys, because we were down a halfback. I don't know why, I did, but we we didn't have a halfback to go yeah, to." Paul Green. I and think he, Paul Green got injured. I think. Yeah, that's right. And so anyway, he goes, "Listen, boys." He said, "I'm thinking about doing something a bit different." And we thought, yeah, this will be good. Mm. He said, what about Alf? And we all thought he was playing England. And we said, well, fuck, you know, <laughs> yeah, what about Alf? <laughs> and, we, and we'd all played a lot of footy and we loved him. And we, and we knew he'd be, he'd be right if he was asked. Mm. And, and we said, well, we all thought about it and kicked around a bit. Yeah, why not? Bug it. Let's do it. And he said, and we away and goes, well, that's a relief because he's already on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so he, Wayne had made his decision late. Don't worry about that. He didn't tell anyone. He honestly had to. He had to get a pass to the various officials. So there were people who knew, but they kept it pretty quiet. Um, and then Alf come back and, and mate, I don't think about Alf in that. Alf's a really happy-go-lucky sort of bloke, and always a joke, joker and prankster and all of that. And he's a wonderful fella. Mm. I've never seen him so serious in my life. Mm. The whole way through that camp, he was subdued. Um, and by then, the origin the origin camps were changing. Uh, not to the level they are now, but there certainly it wasn't the three or four day drinkathon that it once was when we started. Mm. And so, it was, but, but he was tame, mate. By all mm. standards, he was tame, he was quiet, he was switched on. Mm. Um, and I think he understood intimately the risk that Wayne had taken for him, number one, because he's very close to Wayne. Yeah. But um, number two, that he would look very, very foolish if this went wrong. Mm. And, and Al's a, a very proud person, and he would not want that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, and so he put he put as much effort as I've ever seen him in a, in a origin camp. I want to say he always put effort in, but, but he was very, very – he was switched on. You just knew it. And that had a – that had a really profound effect too, I think, on all those younger players. Because mm. he's, you know, he, you know, particularly for some of the younger blokes who, who may not have played much footy with him, and, you know, he was legendary, you know. And so that he was there, but he wasn't, he wasn't the alpha we knew. He was a serious alpha. Mm. Um, it had a profound effect on those blokes, and they knew, well, you know what, this is on. And it was another masterstroke for Wayne. Not, and obviously, Al scored a try and played well and all the rest, but we know that. Mm. But more what he injected into that camp, I think emboldened those younger players to again believe that we could replicate what we'd done in the first game. Mm. They believed again because we got Alan Langham, you know? Yeah. And I really think that that meant heaps, you know? Um, and But to me, I was just glad to be playing with one of my great mates again. And, and you know, we were, we'd, we were just excited that he was there and we just knew he'd make the difference. We were, I was actually confident when Wayne, when he came back into camp and he was what he was, I thought we would win. Oh, and, and it's funny it's funny to say that, but that's the effect that he had, you know. And you know what? Again, it comes down to that thing where, where people sometimes talk about, you know, uh, some people call it bullshit, you know, Queensland spirit and Queensland passion. But again, going back to this whole, that whole Blues, the Blues era of that time, there was just something really arrogant about it, which I didn't like, as I said. But getting back to Alfie, and I don't want to go into the detail of the game because everyone knows about it. But from the outside looking in and from the people I've spoken to in, in my many trips to Queensland, whether it's for footy or work trips and having a beer with people and speaking about Alfie and reading articles about him, is that like you've said many times, particularly in episode one and now this episode 12 as well, you talk about Alfie laying of the larrikin. But to me, it seems, or, or it seemed in his career and the way he walked away in 99 is that he needed to be wanted and he needed to, to be the leader of the blokes on and off the field. Did, did that was, it, was there a sense of when he came back, he was, he was number one and he felt wanted again? Even though no one, no one wanted to see him leave when he quit, but did that feel like a reason why he left in the first place and why he played so good when no, he came back? No, mate. I'll tell you why he left, because I was there the night he did it. Yeah. And, and mate, he was embarrassed. Yeah. Because what happens when you get later in your career... It's like falling off a cliff sometimes. You wonder where all your ability went. Um, and, you know, and you can be lucky and, and, and sort of get away with it and, and sort of... But Alf wasn't that bloke, mate. And, and you're right about one thing. He loved he loved to be the leader. He loved to be all of that. Yeah. But not because of adoration or adulation from people, because he prided himself on, on you know, he, he is a winner. He was always a winner. Yeah. 
and he started to feel like he wasn't a winner anymore mm. and that he was letting us down and he couldn't do it, mate. Mm. I saw him that night. It was in Townsville. I'll never forget it. Yeah. And he just thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm not me anymore. I'm, mm. I'm letting people down. Mm. And he, to know Alpha's to know that it's the one thing he doesn't want to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a question of him needing, you know, to feel wanted or any of that. It was yeah. a question of, that, you know what, this is what I do. This is my job and I can't do it anymore. Mm. And I'm letting people down. He couldn't deal with that. Mm. And so that, that ushered in the, the, him going to England and all the rest, and then, of course, coming back for Origin the next year. Mm. And yeah. I think he saw that as an offer because his, his career should never have finished the way it did in Australia. Absolutely. And in, the end, and in the end, it didn't. But it was because he came back and played that game. I know in my mind that, or in, in my heart, I reckon, that he, he accepted that. He knew how big a challenge it was. But I think he felt it was an opportunity to show people um, or, or to be alpha again, and mm. to be that leader, and and to and to th- and to go out on the way that he should have, you know, yeah, uh, being the, the wonderful player that he always was. All right. Well, I got one more question for you before we get to these fan questions. Um, and I think yep. I picked this up from from the internet um, the other day. Uh, now you were you were the 2001 Broncos Player of the Year, and obviously then 9/11 happens in in New York City with the the Twin Tower attacks. And I think at the time, it was supposed to be an extended tour. Like, I think it was supposed to be, I, I can't remember how many games it was, but it was supposed to be a legit tour with test matches and then yep. some, some club games as well. Um, were you the first bloke to say no, or were you one of the first to say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going. I, um, I, I obviously don't feel safe or whatever it was. And then it was a completely different Kangaroos team that went. Can you quickly go through, um, obviously, your psyche, and I, and I don't blame you for it, at that time, it was a scary bloody time. Um, no, can you explain under, that whole under, thing? And, understand and, this, mate. Yeah? Understand this. I remember it intimately because one of the great disappointments that I've experienced in my career. Mm-hmm. So, 9-11 happens. Yep. And it happened just as we were going, it's supposed to go on this tour. Yep. And they rang a couple of the senior players and I said, listen, you know, I wasn't particularly worried about going. Yeah, okay. I said, I'll do, I'll do what we're going to do. Mm. I said, but, you know, I think it's foolish for us just to charge headlong. And I said, not because we're not going to be in any danger, mm. but the danger will be if something else happens, we'll get stuck over there. We won't be able to get home. Yeah. And I said, that's going to be the danger. I said, we're not going to be in any danger in terms of, you know, more terrorist attack. This is something happened in America. It's not going to happen in England. Yeah. Anyway, but the whole world was a bit like this COVID thing. The whole world didn't know what the whole world didn't know. So anyway, the ARL got together. They asked a few of us players. and said, well, you know, and they decided... They, and they rightly decided we were the first team in Australia who had to make a decision about going overseas. Yeah. So we were the first who had to make it, and it was when the, when it all was fresh. And the ARL, in my mind, rightly at the time, decided, you know what, well, we can't do it. We just can't. We don't know what's in front of us. We're gonna we're gonna put it off. And so what they said, what they said to us was, you know, what, we're gonna make this decision, but we need you blokes, you senior blokes, to come out and support it. And so I did. Mm. And I wrote a letter in the Courier Mail at the time, and I explained why. And, you know, it wasn't about being afraid or being on the ship, because if people were starting to compare it, you know, blokes going off to war and that. And what a load of bullshit. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's an, that's, an insult, that's an insult to people who fought for our country to, to do that. Mm. But anyway, and I even, you know, people, I got sent a white feather and all this bullshit. Mm. So, yeah, that's fine. I, I can deal with all of that. Because I knew they'd made a decision based on what they had at, in front of them at the time. So then, a week goes past, you know, and, and you know, you get, we cop the flak everywhere, and then there was a union side that we're going to go, and then, they, then the ARL decide, right, oh, we're going to change our mind. Mm. And they ring us up, and they say, we're changing our mind. I said, well, you can get fucked. Yeah. I said, because I've been out the courier mail and written this impassioned plea as to why we're not doing this, and ask for people's understanding. Yeah. And you think, I'm just going to, oh, okay, no, forget, forget that impassioned plea. Yep. I've changed my mind. Yep. I said, you can stick it up your ass. I said, I'm that thoroughly disappointed mm. that, that this will be the case. And so, <laughs> I said, well, I'm not going. Yeah. And I said, it's got nothing to do with feeling like it's unsafe, but everything to do with, you make a decision, you, you put you know, you know, put yourself out there, you decide something, you say something, well, that's what you've done. Yeah. And these weak bastards shit themselves because they were getting pressure. Mm. They get pressure from the public and the media, oh, with this, with that. And they, and they, and all players went with them. Now, 
I, I don't blame the other players because a lot of them, you know, it's a couple of our senior blokes sort of suck our necks out to promote them, uh, to, to, to really go out and, and back the decision. Yep. A lot of those other players just went along with it. So then they went along the other way. It's fine. It's no problem. Mm. But, mate, I'll be dirty forever and a day that I wasn't part of that tour because yep. they pushed me into that position. Yep. I was not a bloke who was given to making decisions and then wishy-washy and changing and all the rest of it. Mm. When I retired from Origin, my knee was buggered. Mm. And Michael Hagen saw me at a Newcastle game because we were, we were stuck for forwards. And, and Mick said to me, he said, mate, you know, can you, will you come back? And they'd already been there. I said, mate, you know I'm not going. I said, yeah. I've made that decision. I'm not going back, mate. Yeah. I said, I made it for the right reasons. And if I go back, all I'm saying is that my reasons were bullshit in the first place. Yeah. And so I had not been a bloke, you know, that came after that. But but I was brought up to, to you know, to be strong about things, if you like. Yep. Yeah. And I think if you make a decision, stick with the bloody thing. Because this is what's the matter with the world today, Curtis. Is people are so wishy-washy. Yeah. And, and you know, they don't know what they stand for. And, and, you know, so so why I'm dirty about it, because these bloody ARL officials were just so damn weak. They just, they just, they just, they made a very bold decision at a time where, and, you know, and everyone else is picking on it didn't have to make the decision. And that's what leadership is, is being mm. able to do that and stand your ground. Mm. And they just, they turned in, it, the, the moment a little bit of pressure came to bear, they just turned. I wouldn't be part of it. So yeah. guess what? I don't get to play in the Test Series that year. And I'm filthy about that because you only get a limited amount of time in that Australian jersey. And that was what I, I put that above origin. Yeah. I love playing for Australia. So I will never stop being dirty on that. I promise you. And, and that's the other thing too, is that uh, compared to newspapers now, what, 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago, the circulation of the Courier Mail was fucking, what, almost a, a million people, something like that? It was huge. Yeah. It was huge, mate. Yeah, and it's not it like. Was a big, and, and it's it was not, a big deal. And it's not like the kangaroos or officials or Jeff Carr, whoever it was at the time, I, I'm just guessing it was Jeff Carr, someone at the kangaroos turned around and said, oh no, uh, look, we, uh, we pushed Shane into writing that article because you would still look like a dickhead if you went on the tour. Yeah. Yeah, no, so. and it was, and it was, that was never going to happen because no one pushed me into it. They asked me to do it. Yeah. And I, I just made it a passion play and said, listen, this is not about, you know, being fearful and all the rest of it. And, and it was, and but I wrote it myself, word for word. No one goes, goes wrote it for me. I wrote it. It was my words, my thoughts, my feelings. Yeah. And I was very honest about it. And I was emphatic, emphatically clear that it was nothing to do with, you know, being fearful of terrorism and, and, and letting them win, mm. but everything to do with we were the first ones. We had to make a decision. Uh, the ARL made a bold decision, and I was willing to support it. Equally, I was not willing to support a mad backflip after after having said all of that. And yeah. so, mate, I, 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 you know, I made my decision. I stuck by it, and I'm proud of that. Yeah. And and that will always mean as much to me as as anything. But equally. It means a it means a hell of a lot that I had to miss that that opportunity to play on that magnificent green and gold jersey. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you set that straight, mate, because I, I was going I was going on very minimal information I had from 2001 online, and I hope someone out there sorts it out and fixes up um, some of the quotes that I not quotes but reasons why you didn't go. So that's a that's something for another time. Um, let's get into some fan questions, Shane, because we're already at 50 bloody minutes. I know. I know. <laughs> see, it's just, we just have a chat, mate, and see That's I get on the I get on the high horse and start <laughs> yammering on. All right, let's get to the first one. Oh, we've got a Queenslander first up. So this is um, from email. This is Stuart from Redcliffe. Uh, he says, "Did you ever have any serious offers from rival NRL clubs, and how much thought did you ever give to them?" I reckon I know the answer to the second part of that. Well, I had. I did have. I never had what you'd call a solid offer, Shane, we'll give you this. Yeah. But there was, you know, there was feelers put out from time to time. But not a lot. And because it, people won't remember this, but I was always so emphatic in yeah. my my loyalty to the Broncos. Yeah. And that was because, and I'll be honest with you, this is not some, it's not some hokey-pokey thing, and, you know, um, you know it's, not, it's not like that. In my life and, and the way my footy career, maybe we talked about this in the first thing, but I never thought I'd be a footballer. And, and I love the game, and, and because of, you know, in my junior years, never made state size, all this, stuff, blah, blah, blah. But the Broncos gave me an opportunity. And then and then when they gave me that opportunity, my dad was killed in the first year I was there. Yeah. 
and they and they back me. They, I wasn't a good enough player at that stage. I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been given the extra opportunity I got. But the Wayne stood by me, and I promised myself after that that I would never ever play anywhere else unless yeah. unless unless I, I had to. That that day never came. And so every time I was ever asked when I was coming up for contract renewal, I always said, no, I'm starting here. And so, and so no one ever really, no one ever believed that I would go anywhere else. So that's why I never really had any great overtures. People from time to time, you know, you'd hear a whisper and, and, and maybe, you know, someone would say something to me. But no, there was never any clear cut offers and it wouldn't have mattered because I wouldn't have gone. Mate, I reckon if you played now, you would have been linked to the Roosters every three weeks, I reckon. Yeah, possibly, but I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> All right, next question up. Paul from Ludnam, which is um up the road from my joint. How well do you and Kevin Campion get on, and were you dirty? You got. Hang on, I've got to clean this up because there's some swear words here. <laughs> How well do you know Kevin Campion, and were you dirty that you got your arms held behind your back in that brawl against the Warriors in Auckland? Okay. So anyone who knows me knows I can't fight for shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so it is no surprise that I got dushed up a few times. Yeah, but was, was, never, was it better off that you had your arms locked? Yeah, because it wouldn't have, the, the, the result wouldn't have been any different. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, PJ Marks, the dirty little bastard, was holding on to me. He can't pay just. And Kev and, and I are great mates. Yes. And, and always have been. And, mate, that was, and it's like he said, my problem always was, is that I was offended when someone tackled me. And he tackled me and I pushed him and said, you fucker, or something like that. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> and then he just got out of hand, he snorted me. And guess what, mate? I probably asked for it. So, so I've got no malice toward him. But, mate, the answer to the question is, we're great mates. The, the, other, the other thing that must be noted is that I am a shit fighter, okay? <laughs> Well, I think it was it you and Phil Bailey in an or. All right. So next question up, next question up is from Corey in Albion Park in South Coast, New South Wales. Um, he asked, Wayne Bennett has a lot of fans, especially many ex-players. There are also a few that appear to not get on with him once they've left him. Uh, I assume that means left, um, you know, the club he was coaching about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Yep, yep. Why is that? Well. It's a it's a human being thing, um, I suppose. And, and look, Gordy's a good example. Yeah. Um, Gordy and Wayne, you know, if you if you read, if you even believe half what you see in the media, and Gordy's pretty emphatic about it. Um, he's no fan of Wayne's. Mm. And and look, that that goes back to you know, Wayne put him on on the bench for his last game uh, in Townsville. Yeah, it's semi the semi final, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and it was, and I, I, I'm not sure whether Gordy was playing well or wasn't playing well, but I remember it was done because. And we didn't think, because it was a semi-final and the Cowboys had never beaten us, so we didn't think that they were going to beat us, I suppose. Yeah. But we were worried about it. And so the idea of Gordy coming off the bench, it's my recollection, was that he was going to inject some some punch into us. Mm. You know, look, come on on the 10 or 15 minute mark. So I don't think it was punishment for form or anything like that. Mm. I think it was a bit of a ploy um, to sort of, you know, get a bit of an upper hand at, at a time when we needed it. But mm. it didn't work out and we lost. Mm. And, and I and I know that that you know because Gordon had all his family. I understand why he was upset about it, blah blah blah. And I and I think that then that you know there's probably other things too that I don't know about that have caused that. But it's as simple as this. Like you know, it, human beings we don't all get on. And so I, I mean I'm I'm tremendously close with Wayne. He was he was he it was in my life at a time when I needed someone like him. And and and. We're from similar backgrounds. We grew up in a, in a similar part of, of Queensland. Yeah. And so we've got a lot in common, mate. We're good mates, and I like him. We get on, and we've got similar interests. Mm. You know, a lot of players who play with him, uh, who play for him, don't, don't, you know, don't have that. Uh, and, and quite simply, while well, Wayne is as good a man manager as I've ever met, he can't be mates with everyone he coaches. Mm. And, 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 mate, he, the other thing he's had to do, and he's never been afraid to do, is make tough calls. Mm. I promise you, he'd have made them on me too if he had to. And yeah. maybe then that would have changed my relationship with him depending on how I took that. Mm. And, and I think you'll find most of the players who have a beef with him have probably made a tough call made on him. Yeah. Because the one I know doesn't play favourites, doesn't play agendas, doesn't play politics. He just plays it. If you're playing well, you play. Mm. It's that simple with him. So I, I don't buy into the thing that he that he has his favourites. Maybe, maybe it 
you know, in terms of people he likes and all the rest of it, he gets on better with some of us more than others. That's natural. But I don't believe that, that um, in many occasions, at least, and he's not infallible either, um, that, that it would be that he's deliberately wronged someone and that's what's caused a, a rift. I don't believe that would be the case. Inadvertently, he may have done so. And, and so then you get players who, who don't have a big rap on him. Mm. But I think, I think they're in the minority. I think mm. most people who have played under Wayne realise that, you know, even if he didn't get it wrong, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it, if he didn't get it right, rather, it wasn't intentional. So, um, you, know, you know my feelings, and I would have been very strong on this in our first episode, mate. I, I, I don't think there's a, a better man that's been involved in rugby league. Oh, look, and there's no, look, there's no surprise that, that, that he's still coaching in the NRL because... He's still doing something right, so... Um, Absolutely. <laughs> players, still, players still want to play for him, mate. That's, that's it. What coaching they, is. they follow him all around the country to play for him. Yep. yep, and that's what coaching is, mate. Coaching is about getting players to believe. Yeah. You know, because rugby league's simple, mate. You and I know what it takes to win a game of rugby league, mm. you know, but that doesn't mean we can coach. Yeah. Um, coaching, coaching's about leading people, and it takes a certain type of personality to do it, and I've never seen anyone better than him. All right, next one. Oh, next. This is an international one, Shane. This is from wow. Wrexham in Wales. Uh, Excellent. Marcy... I, was in Wales, I was in Wales late last year. Were so you? Perhaps I ran into this fella. Oh, he, he's probably, he's probably, he probably kicked, you out of your pub, pub, kicked you out of a pub somewhere. Uh, Marty, Marty from Wrexham. He says, did you ever consider playing in Super League at the end of your career? Yes, I did. You did? I must have certainly did. And I went very close. Um... Um, to going to Salford. Right. So yeah. Salford, Salford had just got a new owner um, and had a bit of money. Was that uh, the, and, doctor, the doctor? Oh, I forget who it was now, but he, he was, right. I met him. Yeah. He was a nice bloke. Anyway, um, so it was an Aussie bloke who was their footy manager, and I forget his name now, but he was a nice bloke. We had lunch one day, and I went to Wayne and I said, Wayne, and this is, you know, Obviously, I think this might have been 2004. Yeah, we were there with the Australians, so Wayne was the coach. Yep. And I said, Wayne, do you mind if I go and talk to these fellas? I said, you know, and I still had a couple of years to run my Broncos contract. And I said, they're talking about me coming over there. I said, I'm not, I'm only half hearted about it, but I said, would you mind? And he said, no, 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 that's fine. He said, you've, you've earned the right, you know, you've always been loyal to us. So he said, you know, go and hear him out. And if something comes of it and, and you, you know, your mind changes and you decide you want to go, we'll see what we can work out. Yeah. So he's really good about it. And I look, I think the problem was I was probably too honest once again because I got in front of this bloke and they were offering it was bloody good money. Mm. Um, and, and I and I was really starting to consider it because I thought, oh, this could really help. But my knee was bugging and I knew it was bugging and I knew I was going to stop. I'd, I'd retired from Origin that year. I was going to retire from from this is 2004, so I was going to retire so I could give the, the club my, last, my best of my last two years. And my knee just wasn't great. Mm. But I knew it was all right. And I said to him, I said, mate, I can't in clear conscience sit here and let you offer me all this money and not tell you that I've got a knee, which is a real problem to me. Yeah. I said, it will not affect how I play. And I went on to play two more years at the Bronx and, and went okay. So so clearly it was, it was okay. But I said, mate, I can't ask you to, I, I cannot not tell you that, I said, because if I don't tell you, no one's going to tell you. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no one you're going to ask who's going to say, oh, I'll be careful of his knee. Mm. So I'm going to tell you that it's a problem. And, mate, I think that's why I never went, because I think they changed their mind because of that. Because, and, and, that, and that was as much for me, too. I didn't want, you know how parochial English crowds are and English yeah. clubs are. I didn't want to go over there and not do a job either. Well, they, that, so, that, they, would, they would expect Shane Webke that they see on TV. That's right, and I and I didn't want to go unless I could do that, and I and I, and I did believe that I could. Mm. I, I wasn't worried. I didn't think because I was only I was only um, thirty one then, yeah. and I was still feeling really good. I was just worried that I was more worried. I didn't understand that my knee wasn't going to blow out. Mm. I was worried that it might, mm. but at the time I was still playing good footy and I was in the Australian side, and and so I, I was I was charged along on it, but I I'd been led to believe that that it could have. Um, by doctors and physios that, you know, this could, the crunch could come with this and it could come quickly. Mm. So I just didn't want to put them in that position. Different, different thing is the Bronx because I'd, you know, I'd worn my knee out playing for them. So, you know, that was a different scenario altogether and they knew about it. So there's not going to be any secrets there. So, so yeah, the answer is I did 
I did very much seriously, and I'm, I'm, I remain disappointed to this day that I didn't. Yeah. Um, because I love I love England, and yeah. I love the way they love rugby league and and their crowds, and the, I I love nothing more than going on tour to England. It was one of the highlights of playing footy, and I've been back a few times since on holidays. I took my family on a big holiday through there. We had Christmas in Scotland and, and drove up through Yorkshire and everywhere. I love the place, mate. It's a great country. And look, that, and clearly you're very passionate about it. How dirty you were about the kangaroos in 2001. So there you go. Um, oh, I was filthy about that, mate. <laughs> I'll never stop being filthy. Uh, all right. So this one's oh, almost said Scott Logan then, but it's Scott from Logan. Which opposing player did you always have the most trouble with? So I guess what he means by that is um, a bloke, you know, an opposing player that that may have had a bit of a step or was a little bit um, awkward to tackle. Did you have a player that you always went, oh, here we go, he's not going to knock me out, but I, I always had trouble with him? Uh, Does that make sense? Anyone who could step. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Menzies, someone like that. <laughs> oh, mate, anyone. Anyone yeah. like you, mate. It was, look, the problem when you have, you know, being, being, and I was reasonably mobile, I suppose, but when you're big, and changing direction is pretty pretty hard. Like some of them tricky little buggers, mate. They used to get man knots. But but yeah, I suppose the players I would have the trouble with um, being a defender in the middle, particularly. Like I never against opposing forwards. Like there's always big bash ups with different forwards, like Paul Harrigan and blokes like that. Mm. But that was you expected that. That was there was nothing particularly notable about that. Mm. But I guess. You know, the players always worried, and all front rowers are the same. The ones we always worried about, the steppy blokes, because yeah. they, they, could, they could make us look stupid. Matty Barham once, I remember when North Queensland, obviously, and he was playing fullback. And for whatever reason, and it must have been early in the game, because I, I chased a kick and I happened to be the first uh, chaser down there. Mm. And I could see Matty Barham get this ball, and I thought, well, this is going to be fucking interesting. <laughs> I reckon he stepped me four times. Four times on the way around me, he stepped me. <laughs> But he went around me, and I knew he was going to. I looked at him, and I thought, Matty, because he was, he was, he was super quick, but just would, he could jump off a five cent piece, and turn yeah. around anyway. And I just knew. I looking at him, and thinking, well, he, it's just a question of how he's going to make me look stupid, and and he did. Yeah. And that's and that's one example. But yeah, always the steppy blokes, and but no one in particular. There's no one, no one player. But anyone, anyone who had good footwork always used to worry me. But all, always worried. Front rowers always worry with blokes who had good footwork. All right, so there's, there's, I've got three more, and one of them's from me. So this one's from Kurt, Curtis in Campbelltown. Um, we mentioned in episode one, um, you always wanted to be a Bronco, and I think you've explained now too, with the passing of your father, you, you were never going to leave the club, seriously, anyway. Yep. So my question is, what was it like when Super League was coming through 95, 96, um, as, a, as a young pup? coming through the Broncos system and you had to come down on all these road trips and I know Wayne Bennett loved the road trip to Sydney it was like mini origins for him but what was it like for you personally um, did you take take it personally when you heard crowds you know the ARL traditional crowds um, I remember being at Campbelltown one night calling you Super Cats you know because Super League and all this stuff what was yep, it like yep. for the Broncos and, and as a young bloke you know and you're just putting your hands up saying I just want to play footy I don't know about all this stuff what was it like playing at Campbelltown what was it like playing against Balmain at Leichhardt or the Dragons at Cogra, coming through just before Super League when everyone knew you guys were going. And in a way, you were catalyst with John Rebo and Chris Johns and all the rest uh, in a certain way. What was it like for you coming through and being part of that kind of um, Super League, Super Broncos thing against the well, ARL sides in Sydney? Well, first and foremost, because I was in the early stages of my career, we, we weren't asked. It wasn't a decision that we were asked to make. The, the senior players at the Broncos, that they, they were the direction yeah. that was taken. We never got, we never got the financial benefit either. Yeah, um, right. So, two things. So we never, all you know, all that mad money they threw around. Well, we weren't players. Our younger players, like me and um, the likes of Brad Thorne and, and blokes like that, we were, we were on our way up. So mm. we weren't really the benefactors of any of that sort of mm. money. Mm. Um, but and because of that. We actually thought it was quite funny when we go and then, then people would be calling stuff out because we thought they meant the other players in the side. In the side. We didn't no, think it was all of you, mate. We had it all yeah. of you. Yeah, I know, but it didn't worry us, mate. We yeah. were used to it. Yeah, of course. Like, I, couldn't have cared. I really couldn't have cared less. Yeah. And look, the one thing, and even 
even Sydney crowds when they are getting really parochial and that. The one thing I always loved about rugby league crowds is it never seemed – I had blokes yelling at me at times and yelling all sorts of profanity and, and, and you know, and you, you'd turn around and laugh at them mm. and they'd laugh back. Yeah. Because yeah. it was all a bit of fun, yeah. you know. And that's what I loved about our crowds. Even as much as they, they – and some some obviously went too far with it, but, but most, if you turn around and give them a, a sly wink or said, you know, sort of said something, yeah, yeah understand what you're saying, mate, they, they respected that, and so mate, I never, I never had a problem with it, mate. I just think, you know, um, one of the great things about our game, mate, is the people mm. and the people who play it. Number one, and I've played it my whole life, mm. and, and I, I love it. But I love the people around it too, mate, because they're real. Mm. Yeah, you know, rugby league. We, you know, you think about all the scandals that we have and all this, and, and you know why it is. Because, mm. by and large, rugby league people are pretty plain and pretty, pretty, you know, and that doesn't mean we're stupid, but no. it means it means that you know what it is, what it is. Yeah. So if you, if you do stuff some up, we air our dirty laundry fairly well because yeah. we stuff things up and finds its way to the paper. This just that's how right. it is. <laughs> and then and, you know we just soldier on and realise that you know that's rugby league. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that some of the things I see. You know, p- people in our game do that I, I like. I, mm. Obviously, that's the case. But by and large, I love the people that are involved, involved in our game. And, mate, I love the people who, who supported the game in the era when I was playing. Mm. Because, mate, I'll tell you what, they're the ones who make it who make it so enjoyable. It's great being part of a club and a team and all that. But supporters, both opposition and your own, mm. they're, they're what provide, provide atmosphere and, 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 and they make us... They make you. They make you grow. That, mm. That's what makes you play, and, and for one reason or another. So, mate, I was incredibly blessed to be part of an era where where I truly believe that we're the greatest supporters, greatest players. It was a great time. Two more for you, Shane. I'll let you go because it sounds like you're not driving anymore. So we're getting very close. No, I'm still driving. Still I'm going. Still driving. I'm, just, I'm in Toowoomba now, so oh. <laughs> we're, off, we're off the highway and off the on nice soft <laughs> roads. <you know? laughs> They're not dirt roads, are they, Shane? Oh, come on, mate. No, See, I'm from, very, hey, I'm from Cambridge. That's a, very, that's a very New South Wales thing to say, mate. No. We don't live, you know, we've got bitch, but we've got, we've got electricity now, too. Shane, I, I, I say that all the time. I'm from Campbelltown, buddy. You know where that is. That's uh, I'm just... Well, I'm yeah, with you. Yeah. I'm with you. I shouldn't be yeah. throwing. I shouldn't be throwing stones. <laughs> Two more for you. All right. One from one from Mick. He's from Newcastle, and it's a Knights question. Um, it's an interesting one too because I've never heard you speak about this. After you guys won the '97 Super League Grand Final, did you guys sit down and watch the RL Grand Final on Sunday? Um, you can't remember. <laughs> I, mean, I don't remember because we would have been drunk. Of course. But... But yes, we would have definitely. Yeah, yeah. There's no way in the world. But you got to understand, all of that Super League war, mm. it wasn't between the players. Players, players. You know, because they were, you know, we all had mates in Super League sides, mm. uh, in ARL sides. Yeah. So no, we weren't. We were. We weren't. It wasn't a personal thing between players. And so, mate, we definitely would. And I think oh, now it's hazy, but but I'm almost certain. Well, I'm not. I don't have to even know. Mm. We would all be together somewhere, and we would have watched it. There's yeah. no two ways we didn't, mate, um, because we're all footy fans too. Yeah. And, and it, so it was, it, it was intriguing to us to see what the other – and, mate, it was such a good grand final. This yeah. was a cracker. And, so, and you know what? So was ours. Yeah, it was, good, it was a good game. If you, if you guys didn't have Steve Randolph, it might have been a little bit closer. Exactly. <laughs> so, 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 but they were both really good games of footy. And obviously Newcastle getting up, and that was their first victory. And, mm. you know, that was – no, mate, it was as much as it was a, a horrible thing that happened in our game. Mm. Both competitions were pretty darn good. Absolutely, and and the thing I can back up for that in episode eleven last week with Tony Priddle, the Dragons prop, he spoke about the fact that, and I didn't know this, he actually signed with the Bulldogs to move on from the Dragons, and before that happened, at Cogra before Mundine and Talis left, they were playing touch footy Super League versus ARL players within the Dragons <laughs> squad. <laughs> so I don't think I don't funny. think the players didn't care. I don't think the players cared. Uh, last, uh, they, they didn't, mate. I assure you. Last one, and this one's from Bexley, and this could be from anyone in Australia. I'm the only Bexley I know is in is in Sydney near Canterbury. So let's say that for now. Connor from Bexley, he says, did the Broncos ever talk about? Uh, and I guess this is within the playing group, uh, a possible grand final in that golden era uh, against the Raiders when the Raiders were so good as well. Did that ever get spoken about? 
up there in Brisbane about a possible Broncos Raiders game in their grand final? No. No. But you, no. you, you were the two. You guys were the teams, and everyone talks about it, right? So I guess it's a fair question, but um, from a personal standpoint from the players, I guess it's just you get on and play whoever you play in the green final. Well, you right? do, mate. When you, when, you, when you, you know, obviously all the, all the sides you cycle through and become, you know, um, I guess I was fortunate that for the whole of the time I played at the Broncos, we were one of the, the dominant clubs. Um, and, now, and now we're not, if you, if you know what I mean. So, so you... But when when that's the case, when you when you're involved in it, you really don't think about that. That's a that's a that's an outside looking in perspective. Yeah. And, and players, you really don't have time to think too much about things like that. What what happens is you you knuckle down and and you pl- you play your week to week stuff. It's 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 harder work than people realise because I mean footballers get this bad rap and we, and we earn it. Don't worry. But that you know we sit around with all this time on our hands. But it's incredibly the, the training and the commitment that's required to stay at that level is quite is quite amazing mm. um, and what it does it robs you of a lot of um, time if you like to, to ponder and reflect anything you, all you're ever doing is thinking right oh, what, what, what's trained tomorrow what do we do tomorrow mm. and then you're worrying about performing and all the rest of it so you really don't think too much bigger picture um, and so you, week to week you look at what, what club we play and, and of course when you come up against the strong clubs you'd always think oh shit She'll be on. She'll be on this weekend. Mm. But you never, you never thought as far ahead to say, I think, oh, I wonder who will play in the grand final. It was, mm. or, or you know, you wonder whether we we'll, if we make the grand final, who will we play? Yeah. You never thought about it because you, one thing you, you end up knowing is that, you know, oftentimes clubs you don't think will get there do get there. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's one of those things. And as the season plays out, of course, injury and all, and all that sort of stuff plays in, and um, so you never really quite think about the context of, of what clubs are doing, what you're worried about, what you're doing, really. Shane, mate, again, thank you again for your loyal... Uh, not your loyalty, your, well, I, I guess a little well, bit. I'm loyal to this podcast. I've not appeared no. on another podcast. <laughs> I, won't, I just won't. I didn't mean... I, won't lo- I, did, I meant honesty, not loyalty. I even had honesty oh, written right. down. I'm sorry. <laughs> what I maybe meant was your loyalty to, to the Broncos, the, the Australian jersey, and, of course, the proud state of Queensland. Um, and I think people understand that when they listen to these podcasts too, particularly when you're on, they really do appreciate it and, and to get an insight into your career and how you think, mate, and, and people really do love it. So I wanted to say thank you again. And uh, well, how many episodes was that? One to 12? So 12 episodes. Um, I'll come back at 24. No, no, we'll get you on before then, mate. Don't worry about it. <laughs> mate, um, I, I, I just, I'd say thank you. And, and obviously, and, and mate, it's a pleasure to talk to you. You're very good at what you do. So that's... That's that makes it easy for a bloke like me to do, to do something like this. But the other thing is, is that I think you know the people who listen to this too, because they're obviously all great followers of the game. Because I tell you, I, I am loyal to the Broncos. I I will always be loyal to the Broncos. I'm always loyal to both Queensland and also Australian rugby league. Mm. But what I'm most loyal to is our game, mate. Yeah. I played this game since I was a little boy. And all of my best mates in this world played alongside me. Mm. And in my junior years is where I found, you know, that's where I found my real love of our game. And to be out there on a field, and it doesn't matter whether you played, you know, professional footy or not, to have, to have experienced what it is to be on a rugby league field is, is to have experienced something pretty special. And mate, I'll never stop being grateful that rugby league is part of my life. It has taught me so much uh, uh, and has gave me so many of the tools that, that have allowed me to lead a good life. Mm. Uh, and so mate, my loyalty to our game will endure for always. And, and look, people, and, and that's I think what I was getting to before as well, Shane, is people can absolutely see that. And there, there's no Blues versus Queensland with this stuff, mate. And, and it's great to hear your story. And there's still more to talk about. So we'll get you on shortly, all right? Love it, mate. Thanks very much again. Thanks, buddy. Cheers, Shane.